You have to have a plan from the beginning. And most people don't set up a plan. Their plan stops at, I wanna be a famous rapper. These aren't plans, these are ideas. They just say, yo, I'm in the studio every night. I'm making 100 records a week. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm putting in the work. And then tell everybody, new music on Spotify. That's your plan? That's whack as shit. You know what I mean? Like, how are you going to get people familiar with that it's on Spotify? Why is it different from somebody else? Why do people care about you? What else are you going to do besides Spotify? How are you going to get people exposed to who you are as a person? Because we buy people, right? We don't just buy the song. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. As you know, we love to bring on people who represent the No Labels Necessary lifestyle, people who are doing things differently, following a unique path that you can learn from. And today I have one of the most perfect examples of that that we've had on the podcast to date. That was flattering. One of the most, <laughs> one of the most perfect examples. Thank truthfully, you very much. That. Truthfully, truthfully. And we're going to get into why. But Clinton Sparks has been a producer, a DJ, marketer, legitimate entrepreneur, has been a part of so many parts of culture, whether it's gaming, Karma Loop, which I got whole stories on Karma Loop. I did a lot of shopping on Karma Loop oh, back, nice. in, back in my day. Yeah, <laughs> a lot, got a lot of my money for sure. He's been a part of these moments, and I'm excited to be able to get into the mind of Clinton Sparks today. But first and foremost, thank you for hopping on, Clinton, for real. Welcome to my mind. I yeah, appreciate it, man. Uh, yeah. Glad to be here. It's beautiful. It's welcome, beautiful. To, welcome to being inside me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. But, Clinton. After we were just talking about short shorts. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> Get familiar. Yes. All right, you guys got to get familiar with Clint Sparks. This is his tagline that he's had since the beginning of time that I could track. It seems like you've had that um, tagline forever, and you were cognizant of branding since the early, would you say, 2000s or late 90s when you started popping? Uh, I came up with Get Familiar, I think, in either 99 or 2000. Okay, okay. Um, I think it was 99. So where does that come from? Before we get into all these details of the unique moments of history you've been a part of, where does the idea of being brand focused so early on come from? Well, I knew when I was going to get on radio at this point that I needed to be a, create a differentiator because at the time, you know, everybody that was on radio, on any DJ, was basically emulating or wanting to be funk master flex so it was like what can i do that's different um so that was one one part of my thinking the other part was if i'm going to position myself to be a brand it's so funny now because everyone uses the term brand yeah. or I'm a, I'm a brand like like everyone when i was the first 10 years of my career everyone laughed at me when i called myself a brand um, but I knew like when you look at like Nike Just Do It and all these companies that had the name of the company and a tagline. So I was like, oh, I need a tagline. So I sat in my bedroom and just started jotting down a bunch of things. I have no idea what the other 50 names that came up with. But I remember I wrote Get Familiar. I was like halfway down. And I remember I kept going back to that. And I was thinking, oh, that's really dope because it's like me telling you to get familiar with something. Somebody can tell you to get familiar with me. Like it was just a really good marketing phrase for whatever. And then in my mind, I was also thinking I can license, if I trademark it, I can license that one day, like get familiar with the all new Audi. You know what I mean? So like I was already thinking that because I knew when I was starting my career that I was going to build something significantly great. I wasn't just like, oh, I'm a DJ, cool. And that's it. I knew that that was just part of the, the process of getting to the ultimate goal which was to build businesses and empires and, and do marketing. And DJing was just kind of a means to an end to get into the next phase and next phase. Um, so, I mean, I think that's why I never even put DJ in front of my name. It was just Clinton Sparks, yeah. get familiar. Wow. So it was never DJ Clinton Sparks. Gives you a lot of flexibility though. Yeah, you know, and I knew that from the beginning. I didn't want to be pigeonholed or boxed in to being just recognized or associated with that one thing because I knew 
the way that I grew up, I personally was more than one thing. Like I was a kid that would read Word Up magazine and Fangoria and Mad magazine and heavy metal magazines. Like I read everything. So I was a kid that like was, was the culture, all the cultures in one kid. So I knew that's who I was going to be as I grew up. And I knew eventually, not that I could forecast the future of my life, but I knew that I was going to be much bigger than just a one dimensional person within my brand. So that's why I didn't leave DJ on there. And that's why I had a tagline. So, I mean, Get Familiar became so, so popular. Some people thought my name was Get Familiar. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you, a car drives by or, you know, you walk, you see someone like, yo, Get Familiar. Like, I was Mr. Get Familiar. Yeah. You know, and then like it turned into that. Mr. Get Familiar. Clint Sparks, a.k.a. Mr. Get Familiar. Like, that's what rappers and artists used to say all the time because I'm getting the world familiar with them and their music. And I became the brand that helped highlight other brands that didn't even know they were brands yet. See, I, I love a lot of what you said because you've done music at a high level, right? We're sitting in a room, plaques on the wall. I mean, what, kind, what names am I seeing? Lady Gaga, Biggie, Akon. Who you see over there, Ja'Cory? DJ Khaled, what's up, what else we got? Oh, you're right, it's an Tiger, which is crazy. I didn't know you get the Tiger taste right DJ there. Snake. DJ Snake? Yeah. Actually, man, you made a lot of music to my childhood, and then I'm okay, <laughs> looking at these, looking at these a, walls. A lot of great names. So you've done this at a high level, right? Um, millions of millions of records. I think somewhere around 75 million. Over 75 million records, Over 75 yeah. million records sold. So you've accomplished music at a high level, but it seems that you were able to escape something that a lot of creatives that I speak with, struggle with, which is I want to be known for multiple things. I have all of these talents, yet at the same time, I have trouble escaping my, my music box, right? Because I also don't like the bit, well, I don't want to be seen if I get too deep into business as I'm not really an artist and I'm not really valuing the art. There's all these conflicts that artists go through and creatives in general go through. And it seems like from the beginning, you were kind of free and just looked at it as all ideas and things that I wanted to create, whether it was in business, marketing something, or your, your own production or singing, right. right? Where does that come from? Or did you actually, in fact, have a struggle with that at one point and break out of it somehow? Well, I'll say the only thing worse than having no goals is having too many goals. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are thinking about, look, if you're up to bat, the only thing you're worrying about right now is hitting the ball. You're not worried about stealing second or third yet. You're not even on second yet, right? So like, I think a lot of people are thinking about too many things that you're not ready for that or it's not time to think about that yet. So that's one. Part two, which is the most important part, and I talk about this in my books and everything, is you have to have a plan from the beginning. And most people don't set up a plan. Their plan stops at, I want to be a famous rapper. Or I want to be a successful entrepreneur. I want to, these, these aren't plans. These are ideas, right? And there's a difference between an idea and a plan. And most people don't know the difference between the two. They just say, yo, I'm in the studio every night. I'm making 100 records a week. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm putting in the work. And, you know, activity doesn't equal productivity. You know what I mean? So if you're making all of these records with no plan, it was fucking pointless, yeah. right? Because if you don't know what you're going to do with all those, oh, I'm just going to put them online and then tell everybody, new music on Spotify. That's your plan? Mm -hmm. That's whack as shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how are you going to get people familiar with that it's on Spotify? Why is it different from somebody else? Why do people care about you? What else are you going to do besides Spotify? How are you going to get people exposed to who you are as a person? Because we buy people, right? We don't just buy the song. And like, there's so many things that people don't take into consideration when building a brand. Like, who are you? What do you stand for? What do you want people to think about when they think about you? What do you want them to feel when they listen to you, right? And like, these are really, really important, deep questions you have to answer to yourself before you can build any kind of brand, let alone your own personal brand. But like, yeah, the reason why I never kind of fell into that, which, you know, there have been people that didn't understand Clinton Sparks because I do too many things. There was a time where you could ask, you know, five different people who Clinton Sparks is. Somebody would say a producer, a DJ, a host, a guy on E! News, you know. Then like, there's always different things about me, but 
it was my job to then tie it together seamlessly so when you thought about Clinton Sparks, you just thought the talent, Clinton Sparks, the brand, Clinton Sparks, and what that brand represents, what it stands for, and what you should expect when you think about that brand, Clinton Sparks. And what I worked on was that you just expect dope. You know what I'm saying? And now that's, that's a broad thing to say. And some of you are like, well, yeah, everything I do is dope, bro, so I'm dope, right? When they hear me say that. But it's like, no, not just because you say so. You know what I'm saying? Like, they have to say so. Yeah. And in order for them to say so, you have to understand how to project yourself or convey the message of who you are for them to now just start saying, oh, that, that represents dope. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, you tie it all together with this one idea. And it, now I know if I want Clinton involved or if I get Clinton involved, this is going to be dope. Well, that's, that's the, the brand I built for myself is that, yo, let Clinton hear about this. He'll be able to make it doper. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So whether it's a song... Yo, play this record to Clinton. Whether it's a new company, share this idea with Clinton. Whether it's a fashion line, show Clinton this. Whether it's a business plan, run this by Clinton. You know what I mean? So the Clinton brand brain is I make good great. Do you know what I'm saying? Or I can see and I have a vision that knows how to amplify or knows how to take whatever your original idea was and make it better than it was. People value your point of view and your taste. And it goes back to even when I present music. Look, we're all DJs, we all play the same records. What, what the fuck are we, what's our special skill? We play a record that somebody took the time, they're the great ones, they made the record, right? Mm -hmm. So like, as a DJ, what do I do different? It was the way I presented the records. And I can't tell you when I was coming up how many times people would say, I don't know what it is, man, but when you come on the radio, it just sounds like an event. You know what I mean? And, like, and I did that purposely. So when you listen to radio now, whether you're in Atlanta or you're in L.A. or New York or anywhere else, short of Funk Flex dropping bombs, everybody else that you hear like their name punched through the song, pulling the record back, playing a drop, sound effects going by, sirens going on, all that stuff came from me. I invented that style of mix show radio. So anyway, it's normal now. That's what everybody does. Yeah, yeah. Whatever city you go to, let's just say, brand, 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 man. Like, like, <laughs> like, that's what you would hear. Like, even May, 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 Mayback music, yeah. that came from, get, 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 get familiar. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. ask Ross. Mm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I dare Ross to say, that didn't come from, get, 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 get familiar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, but like, it really just comes down to understanding how to present yourself, who you're presenting yourself to, because sometimes you have to pivot a little bit. I might be talking to this audience, and I gotta talk a little different for them to understand me than if I talk to this audience who understands me. So it's like, it's the ability, it's, and this is like, there's super levels to this, but you know how like, if you hang out with your boy and you could say something, and halfway through you're just like, you know what I mean? And like, you guys just know each other so well, like, yeah, yeah, I get it, right? Yeah. Then there's other people that you say, and they're like, nah, what do you mean, yeah. right? And then there's, then there's other people like, you com they completely don't, even when you get to the end, they're still like, I don't understand what you're trying to get to, bro. Yeah. So it's like, those are different ways of thinking. They're different personalities. So it's understanding the different psychologies. And the, the super skill you can have is learning how to think unlike the way you think. When you can learn how to think unlike the way that you think, then you understand how to talk to different people in a way that's different than than what you typically would talk to because your limited experience, however big it is, it's still limited compared to the entire world and everything that's out there. Your limited experience only allows you to think and operate in the limitations that you have from your experience in life. Yeah. So most people don't know how to sit in somebody else's shoes or understand their perspective if they've never experienced it. Yeah. And that, even, that goes with religion, race, genders, cultures, demographics, everything. I mean, we wouldn't even have racism anymore if people just took the time to understand how other people think or feel or what they need. At the end of the day, we're all the same. We all want to be heard. We all want an opportunity. And we all want love. That's what we all just want. And it's, and it's easy to provide that when you understand that 
and when you really care about other people and wanting to provide that to other people, because most people just want to provide it to themselves. I know I'm going like way off topic right now, oh, wow. but like there's no way I can tell you how I do the cool shit that I do without really understanding like the operating system within myself or the way that I've built myself by design, not by circumstance. Yeah. So I've built myself by design. Most people allow themselves to be built by circumstance, the way they live, how much money they have, how they grew up, the lack of their knowledge. So they, their whole life and everything they do is they just kind of, they're like a leaf in the wind. It's like whatever the circumstances of my life are is going to dictate who I am, how I treat other people, where I end up. So early on, because of my childhood, I realized what I didn't want to be. And then I realized what I wanted to be as I got a little bit older. And by understanding what I don't want to be <clears throat> allowed me to build myself with intention and by design to build a fucking awesome me that I wanted to build that not only cares about myself and treats myself right, but cares about the world. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. You know, if you listen to a group of girls talk, they'll talk about what they hate about their boyfriend, what they wish they could find in a man, all that. The information's right there, yeah. right? You're just not fucking listening because mm -hmm. you don't care to or you're trying to defy it or you're trying to debate why they should like that or that there's something different than that. The facts are the facts. That's what they want. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. doesn't matter what the fuck you think. This is what they said. And that applies to anything. If you just listen, all the answers you'll ever need to win and be successful and caring are right there in front of you. Most people just don't listen. Yeah. So there's people protesting. There's people talking. There's, you know, your girlfriend says, I don't like when you do this to me. Your kid may say, Dad, why didn't you do this? Or all the answers are right there. You're just not listening. So if you listen, then you're going to get the answers of how to build yourself to be the best person that you can be for yourself, for the people you care about, and ultimately for the world. Let's take a quick second to talk about the elephant in the room. If you're an artist trying to grow, we already know what your goal is. A thousand true fans. Everybody talks about it. But how do you actually make that happen? How do you get those fans? It's not just about getting views. You got to push people further down the funnel. So let's talk about it. Number one, do you have these people's data, right? Do you have the ability to text and build highly engaging relationships with these people? Can you boost your Spotify plays to actually have engaged users, not those surface level playlisting plays? Well, guess what? Fever Fan is a platform that allows you to do all of those things in one. So it's not overwhelming. You don't have to switch and have all these different logins and switch all your link in bios. You have even a link in bio tool that you can do. So everything is done in one place. So not only do you grow your fans, you do it for less work. How about that? Check out foreverfanmusic.com because we know it's not about views for the day. It's about getting fans who will be there forever. Foreverfanmusic.com. Let's get back to this video. Taking that perspective, because I do see the value of understanding how other people think and being able to communicate in that language, right? Especially as a marketer. Marketing is that at a high level. Brand, 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 man. Yeah. <laughs> with that being said, how do you reconcile that with, I want to be authentic, right? Some people see that as being fake, trying to communicate in these different languages. Easy. Uh, actually be that person from the beginning, right? Or, so like everything that I am, being a nice person, being considerate, communicating well, being hospitable, following up, building a great network, being honest. Like all of these things came from building myself from by design. Mm -hmm. I knew that, all right, girls, I hate my cheating, lying husband. Great. Now I know how to be a good man because I know what girls hate. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> or, or like, you know, when I was young, I, I was very, very attentive of, so I got to go back even further. So when I was younger, I was born broke into a broken home. Um, you know, much like, you know, a lot of people, you're on welfare, you have roaches, you don't really have anything, and then you have, like, no-name clothes, so you're getting picked on and getting bullied. And then my dad was an alcoholic and left us, and then I was sexually abused for many years in my home. And then, uh, you know, just, like, always feeling like a loser and an oddball and never fitting in. So 
you have a lot of time alone to think, right? And, and watch the world and understand or care enough to understand why, sir, why does this kid bully me? What's happening at, that's making him do that? Or why does this guy molest me? What happened to him that makes him do that? Why did my dad leave me? What happened to him that made him not be able to be the man I needed him to be? Why, like, when you ask these questions, but then listen, the answers are there. Most people spend the rest of their, time, their life looking for answers to resolve trauma or whatever issues they have that they're never gonna find in the places that they're looking. Dad, why'd you leave? Maybe he won't answer that question. Maybe he doesn't have the answer. Maybe he's dead. You know what I mean? Like, whatever it is, the answers are there. But people worry too much, like, oh, this happened to me, and uh, this happened to me, and, and, I don't, and I need answers. And I, like, the fucking answers are in the world. Just pay attention. People are talking. Listen. So when it comes down to branding and being authentic, everything I do is authentic. If you're an authentic human being, then everything that you do in your business is an extension of the authenticity that you are. If, if you're not, the foundation of you isn't authentic to what you're selling or what you're doing, then maybe you're doing the wrong thing. You feel what I'm saying? So even like, say companies, for instance, I'll talk to companies about connecting to culture, right? And it's like, okay, maybe a lot of them don't understand culture. So it would be difficult for them to authentically connect. That's fine. You aren't from the culture. But if you're going to attempt to connect to it, then you got to go educate yourself. you got to go relate and connect to this culture, not just sell to this culture. You can't stand for culture if you never stood in culture. right? And I think a lot of people don't take the time to really care about the culture or the audience or the people that they're going to do business with or that they're going to sell a product to. You know, think about this. When you're looking for, you know, a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or someone that you want to be with, 99% um, of the time, you're looking at something that fits the credentials that you're seeking in somebody to be satisfactory to you. You know, yeah. they're good looking. They, they got a job. They got whatever. You're looking at all these things like, check, 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 fits me. This is what I'm looking for. Done. I'll take it. How often, and even you guys, speaking of authentic, let me get your authentic answer to this. How many times have you found the person you liked and then thought, but am I right for them? Do I check off their boxes? Nobody does that, right? Once. <laughs> you know, but, but, right? but, but that's when you're being honest and authentic about like, that's everything I want, but I might not be everything they want. Therefore, it's not going to work in the long run right. unless I'm willing to pivot and change to fit the things that they need, which most people are not, mm. right? Most people are like, oh, why don't you change? Or you should do this different. Or if you didn't do this, I wouldn't do that thing. Exactly. You know, and most people want you to change strictly because they don't have the ability to change themselves. Mm. So they're forcing you to do it. So I know that you specifically want to know about branding, but again, every way that I operate, it goes down to these values and principles of the human being that I am that allow me to do the cool shit or the branding or the businesses because they all come from the nucleus of who I am. And who I am are the traits that I'm sharing with you guys. I love that you say all that because one of my gripes today is I feel like people do just want to hear a snappy quote you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Josh. I would never say snappy before meeting Josh. That's our guy on our team from the UK. <laughs> but like a, a, a quick, a great quote and all these things on branding, marketing, relationships, whatever. But you can't really get the true understanding unless you understand the depth and the context. Right. right? So it's like I feel like we follow stuff. We get inspired by stuff. But if you don't understand it, you can't change the behavior. So I love that you're you know, breaking down the, the software. Yeah. behind yeah. all of it. It's one thing to say like, here's how you do cool things. But it's like, yeah, but that doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of, if I can do it, you can do it too. Because that's not true. Mm. Like, we're built different. Mm. You know, I might be able to tolerate something more than you. I might have more patience than you. Yeah. I might have more resilience than you. I might have more perseverance than you. 
Like I might have known somebody that you don't know what other people have that you don't have. So <clears throat> that's bullshit when someone says, if I can do it, you can do it too. Because we're not built the same. Yeah. Yeah. Facts. So switching it up from, well, actually, before I, I leave music specifically, what do you see your primary role in music today as? Innovator, uh, tastemaker, uh, forecaster, um, still producer, songwriter, uh, visionary. What's one of your favorite records that you've worked on and why? Um, um, probably uh, Akon, Sorry, Blame It On Me. Um, because it was a real record. Uh, if you listen to that song, the first verse I was singing to my wife, the second verse I wrote to my mom, and the third verse I wrote to my dad. And like, I literally wrote how I felt. Um, and then Akon like changed some lines here and there that made it a little less, as I said to him, this was a timeless record, bro. You could have heard this record 10 years from now and it would have an impact. And now you dated it by putting a couple of these lines in there. Like, you know, I was on tour with Gwen Stefani or Verizon. You know, he said something about Verizon doing something to his name. And now it like makes me like, what's he talking about if you don't know? Because yeah. at the time he was going through some controversy. So we added some lines to kind of combat what was going on in his real life. Uh, but I have the original version that he cut before he added any lines. So mm -hmm. it's a record that even to this day, you know, I still sometimes get emotional because, you know, the first verse was talking about my wife, about saying, I'm sorry that I'm always gone. I'm sorry that I'm traveling. I'm sorry that, you know, I'm not the present man that you thought you were marrying my job. You know, I used to be homeless. Now my job has me homeless. Right. So, you know, then then my my mom, the second verse was about my mom apologizing as a man on behalf of my dad for not being the man that he needed to be for our family. And then the third verse, I'm talking to my dad saying, like, I know you think we're cool now, but, dude, I'll never forget how you made me feel and fucked me up as a kid. I'm sorry, but the blame's on you for this shit. So, like, now when you listen to that song and you heard me say this, you're like, oh, that shit is cold now when you hear it now. Yeah, yeah. But when we're done, I'll play the, ori the original version. Yeah, please. <laughs> please, for real. For real. So, what, what got you into Karma Loop? Like that type of company, like I remember we talked a little bit one time and you, you, you mentioned that you did marketing or something for them, right? Like what, what made you even a marketing mind to these people outside of music anyway? If you're an artist, a singer, a producer, how do, why do people see you that oh, way? Oh, that's now? easy. Well, before that, I was already marketing myself. Okay. You know what I mean? I was already showing artists how to market themselves. Um, and then I built like the world's biggest mixtape website called MixUnit.com, helping to market DJ culture, DJs, and mixtapes. So marketing was the thing that... I remember far back being a, a young kid, single digits, sitting in the back of my mom's car, looking at billboards, thinking like, ah, that message wasn't done well. Or watching commercials as a kid, like, ah, they're not really getting the message across. Well, I, I, actually, I remember sitting at the kitchen table eating Eggo waffles and like... I don't know, Mrs. Butterworth syrup. And I remember saying to my mom, like, why wouldn't Ego also make syrup so they can lock down the whole breakfast experience, right? right? right. And then she's like, I don't know, Clint, just eat your breakfast, right? Inevitably they did, yeah. but like they didn't then. Or I remember also, because I was a big fan of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups when I was a kid, and I used to be like, if every, they brag about their peanut butter, why don't they put it in a jar like Skippy and Jeff? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, Clint, just eat your candy, right? So like, I was always thinking like this. Yeah. Um, so I never wanted to be the guy out front. That was never my intention. I never wanted to be, you know, a high profile person. I wanted to be the guy behind the scenes that was making everybody else dope, whether it was a brand or an artist. Uh, but, but, you know, growing up in the hood with everybody else and you're trying to tell them what to do, they're looking at you like, man, why do you know more than we do? We're from the same fucking place. You ain't no better than me. So it's like, it, nobody can imagine. You know, I always wonder this, like we can all agree that somebody has better physical attributes than we do. We can all sit here and be like, yo, Jordan is the man. 
we can all ball suck Jordan and wear his sneakers and his shirt and call him a goat and all that because we know he can do shit we can't do, yeah. right? But for some odd reason, we can't look at each other and think, that guy's brain is fucking doper than mine, mm. right? And hold that at a higher regard because God forbid this guy's smarter than me or he's got a better idea than me. We can't even fathom the idea that this guy might have a greater thinking mind than me, right? So like that's a big problem for people moving forward because especially in a company because you're just like going back to me coming up, it's like I did have a special mind. Do you know what I'm saying? But like it took me even a long time to realize. I just knew I knew what I knew, but I didn't realize it was special. Because when I'm young, I'm thinking everyone thinks like me. Yeah. How do you guys not get this? How do you not see it? Right? It took me a long time to realize, like, oh, because their brain doesn't think the same way my brain thinks. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same thing with Jordan, because your, your mentality and your body and your, like, abilities aren't the same as his. Yeah. Right? But you can physically see that. So you're okay to say, yeah, I can't jump from the, 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 the free throw line. Yeah, I'm not 6'5". You know what I mean? But, yeah. like... It's, it's hard, especially for people that grow up the same way you have or in the same economic bracket as you or the same area as you, to, to accept you might be doper than them. Do you know what I'm saying? And, it, and that, by the way, that keeps on going as you grow in life. You start being part of companies and your partner or your boss or none of them can, can accept the fact that you might be doper than them, right? So that's something I had to overcome throughout my career and different companies I've been a part of. And it's like, I'm not overall doper, you know, but in this particular thing, yeah, I'm just, I'm better at you than this. Just like Jordan might be better than you in basketball. He might not be better than you when it comes to, you know, finances. <laughs> I don't know, like something, right? And that's another thing. We hold people that are good at one thing as like they're just fucking brilliant across the board now. Yeah. And you and I both know. Yeah. Most rappers and athletes are not that fucking brilliant. You know what I mean? And, and their teams aren't either. Yeah. And that is what becomes a problem for them because they get their homies to be like, you're going to be my manager. You're going to be my assistant. You're going to be the, you're going to be the guy that people have to go to to get to me. Well, bro, you're about to lose a lot of fucking deals and opportunities because you don't have the right people around you, bro. And it's cool to be loyal and, and help your family and put them on, but you got to put them in the right positions. Speaking of the right positions, back to Karma Loop. So at the time, my buddy Greg Selko was a CEO and founder of that company in Boston. I'm an upcoming DJ in Boston that's cracking as a DJ. So, you know, one, and then my mutual, our mutual friend, Daouda, who was my manager, was friends with Greg and me. And it just was the synergy of our friendship. So then, you know, me and Daouda would do things uh, for Greg and Karma Loop because they, they, they were like the first to do live streaming. So we would bring artists and we would create like campaigns and, and then I would just do marketing and promote Karma Loop and stuff like that. So that's how I got down with Karma Loop. Yeah, Karma Loop real first entry in the music was what, was like Kid Cudi or wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like Karma that? Loop yeah. Yeah, definitely was a, played a big role yeah. in Kid Cudi, yep. Yeah, yeah I remember that because that was a huge part of his come up, like just being attached to them. Like they went hard for the music. Yeah, yeah. No, the like Karma Loop was, was the end all be all when it came to streetwear and fashion and... Uh -huh. And like Greg, he was really, really an innovator when it came to, to building that and then bringing Kid Cudi and, and doing all that stuff. Man, I used to love that brand so much. I was, uh, I was the first person onto that brand. And this like, guy. I was. Yeah. I was in my area. I was. It was the whole thing. <laughs> On my street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in my school, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Because I had an older brother and like I was, I got deeper in the fashion. He would go into like to New York and bring clothes back. So I was always, and then I, I was in li online. I couldn't play outside with my older parent, uh, siblings. Mm -hmm. So I found a lot of stuff online. I found Karma Loop and then I would start shopping on Karma Loop. And then I told this girlfriend of mine about it. And then she just went and told the whole school and I lost my plug, right? Yeah. So I, I, I have those specific memories about Karma Loop because it was one of those things where it was like, oh, this is my secret place. I'm going to get all yeah. this shit that people don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> and then now, that was the a moment in time out. for sure. Yeah, And it seems like when you look at your career, there's a lot of things where you're ahead of the curve, right? Um, in one way or another, um, you being a part of FaZe Clan King, um, and then now, well, and then after that, X set and which became one of the fastest growing gaming organizations in the world. Uh, 
people are still just now just starting to put music and specifically hip hop in the gaming world together. It's, that's that synergy isn't even fully figured out yet, yep. right? But I think it's clear. It is figured out. Okay. Here. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> but you but you've been starting that since what like 2016, 17? You yeah, I think 17. Um, yeah. So again, Greg from Karma Loop. He, um, we were working on another company uh, that was going to kind of be a variation of Karma Loop, a modern day Karma Loop. And then he got an opportunity to connect with a guy who was going to buy FaZe. And then he calls me one day and he goes, yo, come to the office. So I go to the office. I go, what is this? He's like, I don't know, man. It's this new shit, gaming and esports. We're going to get involved with this shit now. We interrupt this part of the podcast to get you guys familiar with the delicious and nutritious snack by Legendary. If you're looking for a protein pop tart or something with low calories with a lot of protein, look no further. Legendary. Get familiar. Yeah, so I went into the office of FaZe Clan, which at the time, it wasn't a business. Like, they didn't have a business model or, you know, any revenue drivers. Um, so we went in there and we built the whole infrastructure. Uh, got it to, you know, when I was there, like $265 million valuated company. I brought everybody in there from Pitbull to Offset to Sway Lee, Yo Gotti, DJ Paul, Big Boy, Ray J, Troy Carter. I brought all these people in because when I realized how big this could be, I was like, holy shit, this is like, unlim this is the intersection of everything that I'm a part of, right? So this is like everything my brain has been built for but has been too big for up until now. Because everything I've been a part of, my ideas were always too big. Like you're talking to, to a guy that was on my, my debut of my performances in Las Vegas was lowered by a helicopter through the roof onto my turntables. Mm -hmm. right? So that's how I think. Like I want to zip line into the club, ride a horse into the club. Like every week I had a new idea that like we cannot, you can't ride a horse, it's illegal. It's also cruelty for horses. And I was like, it's fucking Vegas. You guys have shows here, right? So like anyway, so they would always like try to like calm down like my ideas. Um, so yeah, so when I did like from introducing little Yaddy to being part of FaZe Clan at Rolling Loud on the screen, bringing everybody out and throwing out exclusive t-shirts, like that's all me. These are all my ideas, um, of, you know, creating cultural moments and integrating different fashion, music, sports, culture, all into with the nucleus of all being the common denominator is gaming. So built that with FaZe Clan. Then I left that and, uh, we left that and we started Xset with a focus on being the most diverse and inclusive gaming organization because it was super lacking that uh, when I was at FaZe. Not just FaZe, the entire industry. So uh, we were like, let's go, let's go build a version of this that that's us. You know, that, that's Karma Loop. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's all the things, that's music. That's everything that, that we care about and what we've been building. So we left to start that and then it's currently at like a $65 million valuation. Brought everybody from T Grizzly, uh, Ezekiel Elliott, Quality Control Music. I brought all these people into, uh, into, the, into that organization. So, yeah. You said something that was really dope. There's all these ideas that you can have, and I feel like this is a battle that most creatives have in one way. You have these ideas that are bigger than your experience, right? Or your resources at the time. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, oh shit, this FaZe Clan thing. Like, it's intersecting everything. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, you have a lot of moments where it doesn't. I'm sure there's even bigger ideas that haven't been able to be, um, be executed by you yet still. What is that like if you can kind of like walk through that in your career path and finding those moments where you have more control? Because I feel like that'll maybe create a little bit more patience. Like even me, I know there's a lot of things that I've wanted to do and then couldn't do. And then I have a little bit more leeway now, but it's kind of frustrating, just even personally, having these great ideas but not being able to do them. Well, I will say that um, a big problem is that people are so worried about thinking outside of the box before they've even learned to master what's inside the box, right? So, and that's to your point, like, I want to do that, 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 that. Chill out. Do this dope. Right? And an example I can give is, look at Kanye. He could have never put out 808 and Heartbreaks, his second album. Yeah. You would have been like, who the fuck is this guy? And you would have lost interest. Because like, ah, why didn't he do more of that shit? He made me a fan on that. Then he went over and did this shit. But like, when you, when you master what's in the box first, 
then people know who you are back to the beginning of this whole conversation who you are what you stand for what you're about what to feel or expect when they feel you or see you and then when you do something different now you're a genius because oh shit you can do that too because they expect you to only do this now but people nowadays especially young people they want to prove to you how dope they are by showing that they're a Swiss army knife the minute you meet them. Then you're like, I just need a screwdriver, bro. I just need a fucking screwdriver. You know what I mean? And, then, <laughs> and, and, you're, and you're over here like, yeah, but I'm a knife and I'm a corkscrew and I'm a light and I don't, I don't need that, bro. Yeah, but you might need it in a few, but I don't now. Yeah, but bro, like, look how, yo, look how you can use this and da da da. It's like, forget it, bro. Fuck you. Let me go over here now. Right? And it's like, no, seriously, I, even in my book, I talk about like, and by the way, my book is free at clintonsparks.com or the links in my bio, Instagram, at Clinton Sparks on all socials. But even in, the, in my book, I'm like, you're so, you're so feeling that you need to tell everybody how great you are at so many things that no, we, I don't even know what the fuck you are. You become a clusterfuck of what the fuck because I'm not clear at what it is you're selling or who you are. You know how many rappers I meet that's like, first of all, tell me they're the greatest rapper ever. Okay, you already lost everybody that you say that to that's credible. And then when you say, yo, I can make you a billion dollars, hasn't happened yet, you're gonna be the first, you know what I mean? And then, and then third of all, like, you, you make all these claims that are just not real. And it's, and it's like, you gotta just keep it real, man. You gotta just tell people, this is what I'm doing, here's where I'm from, here's what I'm trying to do, check me out. Perfect example, Offset. We were talking one time, and I said, when you guys were coming up in Atlanta, like, how did you promote yourselves? Like, how did three dudes run around saying, yo, get familiar with us, we're Migos? And he was like, nah, we, we never did. We just, we, if we ran into someone, we'd be like, yo, we Migos, look for us. And we kept it moving. You know how fly that is? So now, like, when someone does, ah, oh, shit, I remember those kids from six months ago. That's, that's so cool that they weren't selling themselves to me. Like, yo, we the hottest new trio out of Atlanta. Yo, we do the, the, the. Everyone says the same shit you're saying, bro. Everybody thinks they're the hottest motherfucker. Just be the hottest motherfucker. And guess what? You don't have to tell nobody because they'll tell you you're fucking hot. You ain't got to tell nobody you're hot when you're hot. Just be hot and the world will tell you. The audience will find you if you're that hot. Is If you're as hot as you think you are. Yeah, I bought some very underrated skill set, like selling yourself through action other than words, when especially coming from a creative industry where we're all trying to train ourselves to be great at words, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I feel like very, very underrated skill set. It totally is because that's how, when I started off in Boston, when I'm a white kid in Boston trying to make it in hip hop, which is black in New York, everything's against me, right? Yeah. So it's like, I'm like shoveling driveways to get enough money to get gas in my beat down blazer so I can drive to New York and just stand in front of buildings waiting for someone that looks like they work for a record label. It's not like today where you're just on the internet, you're like, yo, let me reach out and DM all these motherfuckers. And then you're bummed out because they didn't respond. Damn, that's the amount of work you put in, DMing somebody, and that's it. Yeah. And then you're mad, like, oh, fuck this dude, he hasn't responded to me. And you're catching feelings <laughs> because, because somebody that doesn't know you with your bum ass fucking pitch didn't respond and you're mad at fuck them. And now guess what? Check me out. Now they go around, yo, watch all these motherfuckers hating on me or fronting on me now. Man, they don't even know you fucking exist, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this, this whole fictitious world of haters that like everyone's like, yo, I do it for the haters. Shout out the haters. You know, ain't nobody hating on you, bro. We don't even know who the fuck you are. And like, People are just caught up in the wrong shit. I guess the overall theme of everything I'm saying is you're focusing and worrying and doing the wrong shit. You want to know how to do more dope shit and less whack shit? Get my free book. <laughs> Brilliant plug. I love it. I love it. Well, <laughs> but by the way, it's free. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's not. You have two books actually, though. Yeah, Let's but let me, tell, let me say this, though, yeah. too. It's not free as a lead magnet to then sell you something else or to give you a piece of the game and then tell you, but for 1995, I'll give you the rest of the game. Like, nah, this is like, here, bro, here's all the game for free. Because if my goal is to help make the world a better place, it starts by making people better. And if I can make people better by giving them the game or teaching them the things that they can have a better life, 
The hope is, inadvertently, they'll become a better person, which then contributes better to the world, which then makes a better world. So if that's my, you know, participation to help people, the world become a better place, that's the least I can do. You know, how much of a dick would I be if you were about to touch a hot stove and instead of me saying, yo, 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 you're going to burn yourself, I'm like, yo, for $10, I'm going to teach you how not to hurt yourself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, if I can show you and it's no skin off my back, yeah. why would I not? Yeah. Now, granted, I have other stuff you can buy if you want to further, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And I'm not leaning on you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's clarify, though, because, again, you do have two books, right? Um, one is like the 10 traits of your success, yep. something like that. And then yep. the other one is like more music business, focusing the branding. Is the traits one out yet? No. So, uh, well, there was, so both of my books are, I wrote two versions of the books. Okay. So both versions of those books, which are both free, clintonsparks.com, uh, are both music driven. Mm -hmm. How to win big in the music business, 10 traits that made me millions in the music industry. So those books are free and they're both music driven. I also, <clears throat> in in the process of them being rewritten, new chapters and new titles for a bigger audience than just the music industry. Because everybody from, sorry, there was a wow. fly. Um, Damon John, Rob Durdick, Shaq, like everybody that read the book has hit me and be like, bro, these books are way bigger than music. Why are you just limiting to the music? So I was like, ah, oh, let me just make them bigger. Because I also knew that most music artists don't want to read a whole book yeah. and they, if they want to read a book at all yeah, right yeah, yeah. so it's like let me make the most cut out the bullshit get to the point here's how you do this 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 in like a really concise book that's compelling with like dope stories from Eminem to Diddy to whatever in there that you can connect and relate to um, but now I'm going to rewrite them for those that actually really want to level up their business their their personal uh, life. Because, uh, you know, an artist just wants to know, how do I get famous? How do I get money? How do I get my shit heard? Right? So it's like, so it's like, all right, cool. Let me just give you that book here. You know what I'm saying? But like, there's also a lot of people that want to know, no, I like what we're talking about. What are the traits? What are the learnings? Share this experience. When should I pivot? How do I control my emotions during a moment like this? Where do you draw a line of patience? Like, those are the things that are really the tools that will teach you how to excel and dominate at life. But most people either don't want to learn that or don't have the capacity to accept it or comprehend it. Mm. You, you just said something that, that made me think of something. Like you talked about like where you draw the line at patience. And I feel like you know, sometimes we'll see where, let's just say creatives in general may have too much patience where they allow people to fuck them over and, and, you know, maybe push them in the wrong direction. And then we also see what I feel like is... Well, that's not patience, that's ignorance. Ignorance, okay, okay. And I, I think the other side of it is, you know, we typically see creditors don't have enough patience and then they kind of, um, I guess for lack of better words, like dick themselves out of a good opportunity. So, like, what, what, where do you see that line? Like, where is the line for Clinton for, like, hey, I'm, I'm done with being patient now I have to kind of step into a different energy, you know what I'm saying, to get things done? Well, the reason why people lose patience... And the reason why a lot of times it goes back to my kind of wind and uh, leaf in the wind example I used early. When you have a plan and you have the milestones to achieve the end goal, right? And you have to be very diligent about this. And you also have to keep score of your life. Because if you're not keeping score, you don't know if you're winning or losing, right? So like we all have days that we feel like we won today. Right? And then we have the days that we feel like we lost, and then we forget the days we won because we're so caught up in what, the loss we just had. Or vice versa. We have a great day. We feel like we killed it. We're on top of the world. But really, you fucked up three other things that you, that you totally aren't paying attention to. So you have to be really diligent at building the right realistic plan. right? And again, there's a difference between an idea and a plan. You ask most people, I ask, I'll ask students this question. You know, what's your plan? To be a famous rapper and make millions. Great idea. What's the plan? Well, that's my plan. That's not a plan. That's an idea. And that's most people in life, whether it's a gamer, an influencer, an entrepreneur, an athlete, a rapper, whatever it is. 
People just say what they want. They don't actually take the time to research or the due diligence of what it takes to get there and how they're going to get there. Because everybody has their own unique path. And I can't look at Sean's path and be like, oh, I'm going to do what he did, how he did it. Because again, it goes back to different operating systems, different experiences, you know, different tolerance levels. So it's not all the same, man. It's like you have to make your plan for what your goals are. Then you have to have milestones. You have to keep track of it. And then you have to, what's really important too, is celebrate. Celebrate when you make those accomplishments. Because a lot of people don't do that either. So they don't really acknowledge or get excited or celebrate these little things. But these little victories, bro, is like what gets you there. Now you don't get to the top of a staircase down the bar and be like, I want to be up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you walk up the steps. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the steps to your life in your career. Whether it's your personal life or your business life, you have to make a plan. I want this kind of person. I want to have this kind of relationship. I want to be this kind of father. I want to be this kind of boss. I want to build this kind of career. Like, you can't just say it and hope for it and just kind of uh, just move through life like this and, and hope that things happen the way that in your mind they'll happen. You have to do them. And you can only do them if you take the time to do the research and care and listen and talk to people. And I'll tell you the biggest thing, you can have all of these skills and learn from me and other people how to get them. But at the end of the day, the number one thing for any of this to work is you just can't be a dick. Like that's the number one thing. And that's even to yourself. Like ego and greed ruins everything. I've watched it happen over and over again. And to even know that you are someone that is letting those things get in your way starts with self-awareness. Have you ever let that get in your way? No, ever. I'll lose money over letting my reputation or a relationship be damaged. How did you get that mentality considering the fact that you did have a pretty tough, poor upbringing? Because I know what I want and I know what the end goal is. Here's an example. You ready? <laughs> if I'm on the football field and I'm practicing every single day as a wide receiver or running back. That here's my plays, here's my, with my ultimate job is to get into the end zone and score us points. I'm practicing every day to do that one thing. And then it's game day and the ball's in my hand and I'm running through an open lane. Everyone's behind me, the end zone's in front of me. That's my goal, right? Am I gonna let some guy in the audience yell some shit to me and I'm going to be like, what? And throw my football down and care about that guy? Is that what I've been planning for? Yeah. Is that what I've been practicing for? Right. Why the fuck would that distract me from my goal? It wouldn't if you train your brain to come here to do the job you came to do. And that's what people don't do. Your life is your fucking game that you're training to fucking dominate. And if you don't, then it's just fucking there. And it's not built by design. And somebody can come over and fuck up your whole day, fuck up your plan, ruin everything you've been working on, take your girl like every rapper says, or like whatever it is. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's like, that's a fucking whack life. A dope life is like, here's the kind of life that I'm, I've been dealt with, which by the way, most of the people throughout their life say, oh, well, I was born broke or I got this. I mean, you heard, you heard my childhood. Mm -hmm. People have, have had worse or the same. And it's like, okay, guess what? You've just been handed a set of skills that someone that didn't have that situation won't have. Mm -hmm. So you have an advantage over someone that doesn't know how to avoid being molested or someone that doesn't know how to outwit bullies. Someone that doesn't know how to make something look whack, turn it into something fresh, and walk around with confidence and act like, y'all just ain't up on this hot new shit, even though it's fucking whack. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you feel me? But like, yeah. th this is you designing the life that you want. Yeah. And it's not hard. You know, bro, you know what you wanted to do with your life, and now you're doing it. You flew out here to come meet me because you're like, yo, I'm doing this show. Nothing's stopping me. Not the price of a plane ticket. Not Clinton telling me to come two days fucking early when we were planned to do it on the 12th. You know what I'm saying? Not my video guy not making the flight. Yeah. 
what did you do? You still fucking did it because you have a goal to get it done. And people think, people look at like just little things like this one, getting this record done, getting that. Well, if you can do it with that little thing, now just apply that to your life. Like I built the family that I've always wanted. I knew what I wanted because I knew what I didn't have. I knew what I wanted to feel because I knew what I didn't like feeling when I was a kid. Who the fuck likes to feel like they're a loser? Who likes to feel like, you know, a victim? Who wants to feel like, you know, my dad left me? Nobody wants to go the rest of their life feeling that way. So that means you know how bad that made you feel. Why would you want to make somebody else feel that way? And now you know how not to make them feel that way because you know what was done to make you feel that way. How much more do you need to fucking hear? Hey, you can get cancer and die from smoking cigarettes. Look at these fucking pictures of black lungs on the cigarettes. You're still going to smoke, you dick? It's just like life. You're still going to be a deadbeat dad when your dad fucking left you and look at you? You're going to do the same thing, you idiot? The answers are there in life. You just got to fucking listen. Dang, man, that was a great callback. That was a great callback. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, like, we should end that shit right there. Hey, fade the black right when I say that. That was a great callback. Yeah, the reason why it was a callback? <laughs> yeah. Low key, my whole life, everyone's like, you should be a comedian, right? Oh, man. And, like, so, like, the, the, my favorite thing of comedians is when they start their set with something and the end joke yeah. ties back into that thing. You're like, ah, oh, that was killer. <laughs> Like, I even did, if you listen to my mixtapes, I do that. Really? I do that style on my mixtape. In my books, you'll look at it. Mm. It all ties back to, it goes back. You're like, ah, oh, it's like a movie. Yeah. I do everything like a movie. So you constantly um, study other art forms and tie it into your everything, own art? Everything, from fucking watching, you know, slam poetry on Def Jam, the yeah. HBO, to comedians, to fashion shows, to, I pay attention to everything. It's why I understand so many different cultures and so many different mentalities and psychologies and why I can communicate to so many different people and then translate to the room when I know this side of the room doesn't get that side and neither side gets this side. Like, I was the kid in, in school that sat at every lunchroom table. So the black kids, the white kids, the Asian kids, the kids downstairs, you don't even know what the fuck they do all day until they're at lunch, right? And, I, and like, I'm the guy that sat at everyone's table. And I learned early, like, fuck, everyone's the same. We just listen to different music and wear different clothes. Yeah. And if I tell this guy, oh shit, you like that band? Damn, he does too. But they would have never known that. Or damn, you're into Dungeons and Dragons? So is he. Or damn, you like, damn, that's your favorite group? That's crazy, he likes them too. And like, but they never know because they never share these things because they look different yeah. or they act different. Yeah. And I never, and this goes back even further, and this might be what the uniqueness that built me, my mom was always, always, most of our friends, I think all of our friends, I don't even know if my mom had white friends, right? So like my whole life was like non-white for the most part. And then my mom had like lesbians and gay dudes in our house since as far as I can remember. So like I was exposed to like the world very young. So nothing was ever weird or different to me. It wasn't like, why do they act like that? Or why do they do that? Or, so like I understood every culture from like the Puerto Rican kids across the street to black families and how they how their family dynamics are to you know then then I then I moved to the suburbs where it was majority white families at 15 cuz I was getting arrested too much so my mom sent me to my dad my alcoholic dad in the suburbs and I'm like oh this is how white families live so they're like, they're like, they're like, oh, they got a dad that, that works at a company and the mom takes him to football practice and they got two cars and like, it was even new to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like, I'm like, wow, I'm exposed to all these different cultures and worlds and accepted them all. I never looked at anything as like it wasn't normal or that I'm not supposed to be a part of that. Like I never felt like I wasn't accepted yeah. or not accepted because that I wasn't, I also wasn't part of this. Like I didn't feel uncomfortable being in a Puerto Rican family's home because I'm white yeah. as a kid. You know what I'm saying? Not like you feel weird, like maybe you're in like a white family, maybe you're dating a white girl when you're younger and you're like, man, that family's gonna be wilding out when I come in. <laughs> like, 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 
you know, I never felt that yeah. as a kid. Like, I always felt like I'm supposed to be, I'm part of this. Yeah. So with that worldview, how do you see building community? Caring. Going back to caring and giving a shit. Understanding what people need to feel or what they do feel or understanding what they went through. Or like, you know, why do these people think like that? How about actually go find the answer? You know what I mean? People, when, how often do you see somebody say, look at these fucking people, like whatever group of people they're talking about. Like, look at them fucking acting like that. Why would they do that? Go ask them. That's how you get in. That's how you learn. Go fucking ask them. If you don't understand why an Asian, you know, community does this, go interact with an Asian and ask them. Say, hey, man, I don't know anything about your culture. And I find it really bizarre that you guys do these things. And I don't understand it at all. Can you explain it to me? I'd really like to learn. That's the key right there. A white guy doesn't understand, you know, why do these black guys do this thing? Go ask them. When do you see that happen? Have you ever seen that happen? I've never seen a white guy walk up to a gang of black dudes hanging out and say, hey, man, me and my white friends don't understand why y'all do this shit. Can you break it down to us? Do you know what I'm saying? It sounds funny, yeah. but imagine if we all did that as a world, how much more we would understand each other. Yeah. And like, I guarantee if that happened, how many times people like, ah, oh, that's actually kind of fucking cool. Or, holy shit, I never realized you went through that. Mm. Look how long it took for white people to actually finally realize, nah, black people have really been going through this shit. It's not just in songs. You know what I'm saying? Like, it took George Floyd for most white people to finally say, oh, word? It's like that? Like, damn, we didn't, we kind of thought you were exaggerating. Do you know what I'm saying? Or we didn't really believe it was as bad as you guys said it was. I mean, obviously, I know, and people that, like, are connected know, but, like, the majority that don't know, I think, I think that opened a lot of eyes to people that were not aware or were ignorant to the facts. And it made people say like, oh, fuck, man, this shit is, nah, now nah, I get it. Fuck that. That shit shouldn't be happening. I don't know. Did you guys feel that? Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, because it makes me think it's like that. Like you said, asking people is the simpler version, but it typically takes really traumatic events for people to kind of go right. back and look. But it's like, we could have avoided them. Just asking. Right. <laughs> totally. Huh? Yeah. You know, what's funny is like, you know, in the entertainment world, you know, we always talk about this. We've been talking about it for forever, but it's like. You know, it's there's all races and religions and cultures in like music and sports and stuff. Like we all kind of engage and interact with each other. So we'll all bag on each other, make fun of each other, like stereotypical jokes. Like no one ever gets offended because we all love each other. Mm -hmm. And we know there's no malice behind that. We're having fun with life. You know what I mean? We're enjoying each other, the good and the bad. No matter what, we help each other. We're there for each other. It doesn't matter any of those things. And it's funny because... I remember a couple times over my career that us within the music industry, something would happen in the real world and, and we would kind of almost be like, damn, people really be doing that shit? Because it's so weird to see that someone was actually really that racist or somebody would really do something that terrible to somebody else because we would never do that and we all love each other. You know what I'm saying? And I think the whole world can love each other so much more if they just cared and took the time to ask questions. Because like I said, the answers are all there. You just have to listen. So at the beginning of this talk, I said that you were one of the most perfect examples that we've had, the most perfect example that I, um, I would argue on the podcast so far of the idea of creative currency. And what I mean by that is the creativity is the currency and we really try to promote the idea that the creativity is the currency it might get converted into dollars it might get the converted into yen or euros or already but understand are you trying to show us how international you are no uh, no 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 <laughs> but we do have an international audience you know what i mean but just to clarify right so we we you we do already have the currency because that's what the culture is right and the thing that people tap into but it's on the creative to figure out how to make sure 
you're the one who can convert it into whatever that other currency is into the dollars versus allowing other people to do it for you. And obviously you end up with the short end of the stick. You have been somebody who has been very good at taking your creativity and turning it into currency, the other kind. What advice do you have for any of the creatives out there on what it looks like? You know, how do you master turning your creativity into currency? I would say run this podcast back and listen to everything that I just said. Because I don't think, honestly, there's, there's no like, there's no magic line or quote, as you said, that's going to be like, mm, that's the thing that now taught me how to do all this stuff. And anybody that just gives you, sure, there's cool lines and I got a million quotes that I could just rifle off from my, rifle off from my book. But um, there isn't like one clever quote. There's a clever way to live. Uh, and I think like what we all spoke about in this conversation today um, highlights uh, that way of living that will get you to where you want to go, whether it's being a good person, not being a dick, whether it's like building the right plan for you, whether it's not worrying about somebody else's plan. You know, part of like giving a shit about your plan and sticking to it is also not giving a shit about somebody else's plan, right? And I think a lot of people worry about what they're doing over there or what they got over there or what's happening with them and it's like, well, that's not part of your plan. Why do you care, right? And like, if you can really, I'm telling you, man, this is the thing that'll make your whole entire life great. If you make your plan and stick to your plan and not worry about somebody else's plan, you're gonna win. You're gonna win. Love it, love it. Now that's it, man. We appreciate you for stopping by. Well, well you stopped by. Us, I'm used to saying that, right? For allowing us to stop by, you know, um, and also offering us those amazing donut snacks. Legendary bars. <laughs> Get familiar. Shout I'm, out my man, Bruce. <laughs> shout out to Bruce. Everybody, y'all go check out Clinton Sparks' books, clintonsparks.com, and follow him on social media. But this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we and, out. And oh. uh, am, am I not here? You what am I, are. invisible guys? Hey, uh, but, <laughs> most people don't brand. catch it. Clinton Sparks, get familiar. Make sure you follow me on all socials at Clinton Sparks. If you like what you heard today, there's a lot more of that every day on my Instagram, on my website, TikTok, all that. At Clinton Sparks, get familiar. And we out. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.